Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to Last Humans Tech for another quick video. I like to get right to the point. So I've been studying the Security Plus certification. I'm almost ready to take it. And what I wanted to show you today was a lot of the common acronyms that you have to deal with on this test. And there's a lot to memorize. So this will be a part one. And I'll make a part two a bit later when I get a little bit further. We'll just go through them real quick, and I might have a comment or two on each one. So let's start at the top three. This is all risk analysis type of acronyms, and a big part of the Security Plus is risk analysis business stuff. So your ALE, annual loss expectancy. I, I know you can read it, but we're just kind of reaffirming it again in our head. There's probably a misspelling right there. Um, so SLE, single loss expectancy, and AO, ARO, annual rate of occurrence. This is how you determine the loss that will be occurred. If, say, a server crashes, you determine how much money it is worth or how much money it's making you. And a single loss expectancy is how much money you would lose if that server went down one time. And then you can take its ARO, how many times a year it might crash and you combine those two to get the annual loss expectancy when you kind of add the two options together and that's how much money in all you would lose in one year now you could have a crash in a server that would only happen once every four years then your ARO would be 0.25 multiplier because it would be one-fourth of a year you gotta study it all but it all makes sense where it doesn't necessarily have to happen every year you're just going to use your math basically to determine the the money value that you're gonna lose if a particular event happens if a disaster happens etc business impact analysis you'll see that a lot that's in more the business side of this certification mean time to repair sometimes also called to recover mean time to failure and mean time before failure these are again for disaster occurrences server crashes and it's basically metrics which will tell you how long until the machine should be repaired through your business objectives and how long is a server or product expected to last before it fails etc the NIST National Institute of Standards and Technologies is making a lot of these business protocols and decisions so you want to know that recovery time objective and recovery point objective again for disasters for problems that happen with your business recovery time of course is how long it will take to recover recovery point is at which point do you need to recover that data as far as one month back one week back one day back So that's how you handle that the next three are referring to the cloud you have your software as a service your platform as a service and your infrastructure as a service I like to put them in this order where if someone is using a cloud server for their business software as a service would be if they are being presented one particular application that they can use on the cloud and they do not have much control over that application it is hosted by the cloud then they get to a little more control if you if you are using platform as a service in your cloud environment that is offering you the ability to install and configure applications However, it does not give you access to the server and OS itself. Then the final grandest level of the cloud infrastructure would be infrastructure as a service where you are renting, so to speak, an entire server and hardware. And that does allow you to control your operating system, your hardware, your server, everything. You're, you're renting the entire infrastructure, not just pieces on top of that. So common to the TLS transport layer security on the network side you just add a W to that and you have wireless transport layer security that is the equivalent of TLS which is so common on the wired network side some random acronyms that you'll probably need to know RPC for remote procedure call that's usually a type of port that you want to have closed because you don't want people doing remote procedures on your machine it's a security risk so a lot of times you might look for an RPC port make sure it's closed on your network this is not referring to wireless this is just in general and your RDP remote desktop 
desktop protocol is another one that they will mention a lot. It's not something you really want to have open. It will allow people to remotely control your desktop. Usually you want to close that off. Address resolution protocol is also an important acronym for you to know. PPP point to point protocol. Now this is the older, weaker one. It is for smaller networks. It's not meant for a large WAN. It isn't very secure and it's kind of the the dial-up protocol that was used back in the day of like PPPoE and DSL type of stuff there. Now the more common one is PPTP point-to-point -point tunneling protocol. It does negotiation in the clear which could be a security risk then it encrypts the data and packets going through. And you also have layer 2 transport pro tunneling protocol, excuse me, L2TP. Now this is not encrypted, but many times you will add IPsec on top of that L2TP to add encryption to that connection. Now you have some other acronyms that are good to know. You have RAS, Remote Access Service, Network Access Control, NAC. WSG is a web security gateway. It's sort of like a firewall or like an IDS, intrusion detection system. And the authentication methods, you can have single factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. This can involve smart cards, biometrics, cameras, guards, and depending how many authentications you have from each particular section, that would say if it's a single or a multi-factor authentication. Now you might also need to know some of the wireless codes and make sure you know some of the speeds on those. They could ask you that too. So down here you have 802.11 is the most common one, 2.4 gigahertz, 1 megabyte or 2 megabit or 2 megabit per second. That's a pretty slow one. And remember that when you add the G, you're going to 54 megabits per second. You add the N, you're going all the way up to 300 megabits a second. These are the common ones. So remember G and N. It could be a test question. Then you have your 802.11.i. That is just another name for WPA2. So that's equivalent to the WPA2 encryption protocol. Now in a broader sense you have the WAP, the Wireless Application Protocol. That encompasses some of the things below I'm going to mention. And it uses a WML wireless markup language and that is a form of H HTML which was actually the first coding on the phones back when I was working at a cell phone company back a long time ago. I remember they would use the WML language which was real simple buttons and checkboxes before all this fancy phones came out and things like that. So you have your WEP which is the most weakest wireless encryption and it is mostly found on smartphones, mobile devices and you can add the TKIP protocol on top of WEP to add a 128-bit security wrapper a key point here. Remember that TKIP protocol is 128 bit. Then you have your WPA which is one step up in security. It uses RC4 encryption and it can also use TKIP as we mentioned before. The most common and safest one is the WPA2 which uses CCMP encryption. This is a two-part encryption. It uses 128-bit AES encryption. That's important to remember. And a 48-bit initialization vector. The IV is how it first connects to that connection and makes its authentication, the initialization. And then it would encrypt with 128-bit AES format. So remember, the CCMP uses 128-bit, and that is a long, that's a handful there, counter mode with cipher block chaining message authentication code protocol. That's a really advanced one. But remember the WPA2 is the most common wireless protocol used right now. Then you have WTLS like we mentioned earlier, wireless transport layer security similar to the regular TLS on a wired network. Next you have some different authentication frameworks that are called EA. I just got cut off there with my 10 minute limit, so let's continue. 
Next, you have Framework for Authentication, which is called EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocols. And you have some older ones, but the two main types that you, they say you will need to know for the test is your LEAP and your PEAP. The LEAP was very lightweight. The L stands for lightweight. This was proprietary to Cisco only. And the newer version was called PEEP, Protected Extensible Authentication Protocol. This was used by many different vendors, including Windows, and it's a way to establish an encrypted channel between your server and your client. And a few attack methods to finish up. Um, this is mostly related to wireless type things. War driving. That's when you drive around with your laptop looking for people's networks, trying to find one that's unlocked. War driving. War chalking is when you'd actually physically mark people's walls with secret codes on the outside. I'd never heard of that. That's crazy. And you mark little codes saying this wireless network is open. You can hack it and stuff like that. And they can put this wireless network is closed. Little symbols. I never really knew this existed. It's interesting stuff with security. Then you have an evil twin, which is when you set up an alternative access point and you pose it, you basically mimic the ISP and try to trick people into going through your evil twin access port instead of the proper access ports. You can intercept their data and steal their data. Then finally, related to Bluetooth, you have bluejacking, which is basically just sending spam or unwanted messages over a Bluetooth connection, and blue snarfing which is gaining unauthorized access to a Bluetooth connection and to steal data, steal files, things like that. That's a quick rundown. I know it's a lot to take in. I've been studying this for weeks and this is just really a part one. This is only half of it and there's lots of stuff within these docs that you have to just study much, much deeper, do a lot of reading. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching Last Humans Tech. Hope you come back again for some more.